Hello, hello. We are finally live. Um, thanks to all the support and everything for everyone out there that's been waiting for me to do these things. I know we uh, had done a few over the last year. I kept saying I want to keep streaming. I want to keep doing it, but I want to do it right. Uh, finally, I'm able to do it right. We got a brand new camera here. Uh, we got a new camera up here. Can we switch that over? Almost. We got a brand new producer over there. Still learning how to do stuff. Uh, it's on your far left, buddy. You got to switch the scene. Yep. There you go, sir. So. Hey. hey. Hi, camera. All right, let's we can go back to one. So, um, lots of cool stuff going on. Very excited. If you show up in the chat, go ahead and say hi. Um, I put the link out there for a few places. So, uh, don't know who's listening. Um, don't know who's hanging out, but it should be super fun. Um, I got this super pretty base in front of me. This is what we're going to work on today. If you didn't read the description, we are going to make this a fretless base. As you can see right now, it's not fretless. Um, very, very cool Yamaha five string. This is the RBX 755A. Um, just a killer, killer guitar. These things were fantastic. Um, they still are. The customer for this one bought this one and brought it in and the neck was kind of warped. Um, Hello, hello. Um, neck was kind of warped, and uh, after he had straightened out and done a setup, he just wasn't quite happy. There was just still a little bit too much of a warp in there, but he said, hey, why don't you make this fretless for me? And I said, I absolutely will do that. It's something I love to do. So that's what we're doing today. Feel free to ask questions about stuff. You can reach out um, and chat there. Below in the um, description, I have some links. If you're looking for some merch, if you're looking to become a Patreon, donations, all that stuff, that stuff goes like a massive way. Like the, the camera we're using for the head-on is a $2,200 camera alone. So um, we need all the support we can get. We want to get a couple more of these cameras for other rooms in the building too, so that if I'm cutting bodies out on bandsaws, I'm using the oscillating sander, I'm using uh, drill press and all that stuff. We have a camera at all those stations. So if I'm doing a full custom live build, you guys can follow me throughout the whole building and watch me do that stuff. Uh, that'd be really, really cool. Um, so as I say on YouTube, without further ado, here we go. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start taking this thing apart and get this thing ready for us to pull. So uh, pretty obvious, we need to pull strings off. Now I did tell the customer I was going to keep these strings. So if you see me struggling, pulling them out of the bridge, that's why. I don't normally do that. So I don't know if you guys have ever um, played a fretless bass, comment below, that'd be cool to find out in the chat or even on the comments when this gets put up. Uh, it's going to be on YouTube long after, uh, long after the stream's over. So go ahead and leave some comments. Let me know, have you ever played a fretless bass? Have you ever played a bass that used to be, used to have frets, but is now fretless? Um, very few people have, I found out. Uh, I got a buddy of mine who lives down in Texas, uh, bought a base from me and I turned that one fretless for him before I shipped it down to him and he loved it. It was really cool. It was, um, it was a Squire, but it was one of the Korean ones that were really, really great. So sorry, I'm going to struggle with these strings coming out here cause they've been wrapped around. These strings are expensive, so I do not blame people for wanting to keep ones that are pretty darn new. These barely look played at all. So, and it looks like we got a few people in the chat. If you haven't said hi, please feel free to, to reach out and say hi. Um, love to hear from you guys. easier with a lighter gauge. I also want to give a, uh, a shout out to, to Everly for coming in today. You guys can't see him on camera, but he's here. Um, 
helping me out with a stream. Um, he's never done this before. New software we're using and all that stuff. So if you hear me giving directions and stuff like that, it's because we're both very, very new at this and we're kind of learning and trying to figure stuff out. So did I finish the Stumac off kits, offset kit? No, um, I have to do a voiceover section for the painting and the painting video should be released this week. And then we're going to be recording the sanding and buffing video right after that. Um, we can do a sneak peek of that real quick. Ev, can you grab the body right off the bench over there behind you? So I've fallen quite behind, but quite dusty. Here's a little sneak peek of the body. Um, as you can see, it turns from blue to purple, depending on the light. You want to do a zoom in on that? Just hit the uh, the zoom home. There we go. Yeah. So again, this is very raw. We have some orange peel. Um, let's go to that top down cam. Check it out here. Nope, scene two is what we want there. Oh. Yep. There we go. So, can you zoom in on that for me, bud? Click on camera two before you do that. You got to click on camera two, bud. Nope, back over to the controller. There you go. So, um, as you can see, this isn't sanded. Um, so, we have all this orange peel. Now, normally when I'm spraying, um, I can get it about this smooth, which you can see this is very smooth right on the sides here. Um, but I left orange peel on the top and sides so I can also do an instruction on how to get rid of that orange peel. So do not worry. That's what most finishes look like when, when people get done spraying them. The clear coat is on this. This is not what it will look like. That purple, back to the blue, back to the purple. I love what it's at the perfect angle where like the curves are purple and the guitar is blue. So the headstock is also painted like that too. Um, we can go back to scene one then when you, when you get a chance. Um, yeah. Uh, really excited about that, but we got to do a video sanding that down so that I can show people how to sand the orange peel off, especially if it's a first time. Um, someone's doing it for the very, very, very first time. Wow. These are driven in there. Oh. So right now, all I'm doing is I'm just going to take the neck off this base. Um, way, way easier to work on with the neck off. And as you can imagine, to create a fretless base, we will need, oh my, to pull frets. <laughs> um, and all that, again, is much easier when we're not dealing with messing with the body. Always pop out on these. There we go. I'm going to set this body aside here. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> and we have a neck. Um, yeah. That we do. Now we have a neck with some support. Um, there's a lot of options uh, when we're doing this on, on the order in which we want to do things. I tend to not bother with like straightening it out and all that stuff until after I pull all the frets. Um, so we're not going to worry about that until I pull frets. What I would like to do is uh, show you a couple techniques or at least tell you about a few techniques and then show you the technique I use for pulling frets. The biggest thing I want to do is point out the fact that I have a Stumac fret puller. Um, it doesn't have to be Stumac, but it should be a fret puller and it should be a fairly um, expensive one. The really cheap ones are just really tough to work with. They do, don't do a great job pulling frets out. Um, it, it's just one of the tools you can't be cheap on. Uh, the biggest part is there's a flush end on these, and we really, really, really want to use that flush end. So what I'm going to see if we can do is uh, utilize this nice new camera we have here. And let's see if we can zoom in on oh, – so we'll, we'll go back to the side view if you could, bud. Yeah, let's zoom in 
right around the frets here. So nice. What we need to do, I'm sorry, I mentioned I was going to talk about the other roots. The other ways to pull frets. Um, there's a lot of different ways people pull frets. A lot of people like to use heat, and the heat is uh, great if you have glue in those fret slots. Uh, it does help loosen it up. There are people that use collars that go around the fret so that when you're pulling the fret up, it helps not pull fretboard wood, stuff like that. I've tried these, and I really feel like if you just take your time on this part, it gets the job done. There's a couple tricks that, that we want to look at. Um, the biggest thing is just getting the tool under the fret the first time. Once it's under there, you can really go slowly and just work your way across the fret. So let's check this out. I'm going to work on this first fret here. See how zoomed in we can get there. So as you can see, I have about the tool halfway off the fret here. And Already, I got half of it up right there. So now I'm going to slide the tool back and just gently pull the fret out a little bit at a time. There we go. So a big thing that happens is, especially on frets, there's the tangs, which have the, uh, the spurs on there that help hold it in place. And then a lot of times what you do is you, they pull the wood out here. And you can see this is actually a really nice, clean um, fret slot. We had no issue. We didn't have to heat it. We didn't have to put a collar on it. We didn't have to do any of those things. Now, will every single one be like that? No, I just got super, super lucky that we zoomed in on this one and it worked. So... <clears throat> Let's keep going. The hardest part is getting the first part of that fret up. There it is. The higher end tools will also really help alleviate that uh, wood chipping as well because it's going to push the wood down as the tool goes in as well. So that's something this one does. I'm going to try to just get all these started because that's the toughest part. Actually, that second fret was the only bad one, huh? So, um, if you're tuning in live or you're watching the video later on, um, do know that I tend to uh, do work for people all over the place. So, if you have a base and you're like, yeah, I want you to do that to my base, you can ship your stuff here. I can take care of it, ship it back to you. Um, I don't have to work on stuff just local. So, i um, very excited about that. Hey, man, thanks for stopping by. Good to see you. I am really excited to start putting material in this thing. Um, I just love the way a base neck looks when you make it fretless. And just not enough people <sighs> ask for this service, so I never get to do it, uh, which is a bummer because I really love making bases fretless. This is something that's really fun for me. And I also think they play really cool when they're done. So I will tell you right now, we're not going to get this whole process finished today for a couple reasons. The first reason being that I want the glue to dry for about 24 hours before I do any. Well, depends on the glue we use. <laughs> we might use, I think, actually, what I think we're going to do is use super glue. So we don't need a 24 hour period for a drying. Either way, um, at the very least, the setup won't get done today because we are still waiting to get our flat wounds. So I have an order in with the Dario, just waiting to get the 
the box actually physically and should arrive in the next day or two. So we won't be able to string this thing up, but depending on how much trouble we run into, we could have the uh, veneer in all the front slots today. So, if you're a bass player, go ahead and hit the thumbs up on this video so we can get all seven thumbs up. There's just not enough bass players in the world. There's just not. It's unfortunate. For those of you guys listening, how's the audio? I'm using, um, I'm just using AirPods for this. I don't know. Uh, I did a little test. It seemed fine for me. Um, I have these big fancy condenser mics and stuff I could be setting up, but I thought like simplicity is best. Um, also the fact that the AirPod moves with me, stays the same. Three people watching and one of them's a bass player is a miracle. For real. I could find a drummer before I find a bass player. It's crazy. One thing that I do appreciate about bass players too is like they stick to their gear. Like I don't know any bass players that are like constantly looking for new basses where guitarists are like, oh, I need this pedal and I need this new amp and I need this other new thing. And <laughs> bass players are like, yeah, I got this bass when I was 14. I put some new pickups in it a couple of years ago. Still plays great. Oh, yeah, I've had these strings on for four years. Yeah, we're, I'm just making fun of my bass player at that point. <laughs> Shout out to my buddy Dom. It would be awesome if the Daddario package just shows up. Like, as I'm doing this, they just drop the package off and we have the flat wounds. Oh, I highly recommend hand, hand strengthening exercises before doing this. Your hand will get tired. But if you ever find that when you're pulling the frets and you go to like pinch the fret puller, um, and it just doesn't like, doesn't connect. Chances are you just, you slid it up too far. Um, and that's the only issue. So like right here, we can get the frets puller underneath there. But if I go way over here, it's not gonna slide in because I went too far. Chances are you just need to slide it back a little bit and you're trying to pull too much out at once. That happens, especially if you're going fast. I think I, I only advance my fret puller about the half the length of the actual fret puller when I am on that little piece. What I mean by that is if I pull it here, I will slide it about there, and I only use about half a length at a time to keep pulling it. So I move it down at about a rate of this. One, two, three, four. It takes probably 10 different pulls to get that. So. Put a selector switch on one of your bases, uh, for like a pickup selector, or was it doing something like special, like a EMG afterburner or something like that, or was it just a, a selector switch? But yeah, I mean that's like the start of it, though. When you start doing those things here and there, it's like you, you get that itch. Then suddenly, like you you put a selector switch in, and you're like, oh, I can do that. And then you start to get that itch and then you get a nice soldering iron and then, and then you get some new pots that you want to replace. Not cause you need to, cause you want to, and you just start getting that itch. Then you swap out the pickups and then now you're swapping out tuners. Then you put a new nut on and suddenly you find that you're just doing any mod you possibly can. Cause it's just so much fun. 
Wow, no chippies. See, you don't need heat. You don't need heat at all. Let's get a look at that. Oh, I think we're, we're looking great right there. No chips at all. Look at that. And that's how you make a fretless base. Video over, right? <laughs> there it is. All done. All right. Let me zoom in real quick here. Uh, anywhere on this fretboard would be fantastic. I just want to show people a couple little things here. So, a little bit, a couple more. Yeah, you know, how good this camera gets. Yes. All right. Right here we have a line. This little line is, all that is, is sawdust and glue. So when we cut the fret slots, we can't cut just where the fret, just where that tang's going in. We can't. So we cut through the fretboard all the way through, all the way across. And it creates a hole on the side of your fretboard. So you're going to see, if you look at your guitars or basses at home, either you're going to see the edge of the fret right there on the side, or you're going to see a line with like a darker looking wood. And it, all it is is just the sawdust, probably from the same fretboard, that's been glued to fill that hole that was there. The other thing you might see is binding. Obviously, you're not going to see any of that stuff if there is binding, but there isn't binding on this one. So I do want to say if you are trying to do this at home, I would only recommend doing this if you have an unfinished um fretboard don't do this with a finished fretboard um don't do this if you have binding on the edges it's going to be tough to do then too um i just i don't want to set anybody up for failure um because i'm not going to be able to show you the things you need to do for those things so all righty so we're putting essentially We're going to fill these fret um, slots with something, um, which I think I mentioned before. It's just going to be a veneer. Um, we're going to clean these out. What we're going to do is we're going to use uh, some sort of high-end Japanese razor saw. Um, a lot of places sell these, like sumac, um, all parts, things like that. You could even go down to like a local wood specific store um for instance we have a place called woodcraft by us they're they're a chain but um they're kind of small uh rockler something like that and they sell saws very similar to this it's got a very thin blade it is very very sharp and what we're able to do with that is just clean out this fret slot and also get rid of that glue that we have Yes, I'm taking my time on this because if this thing slides, you're in trouble. So now We have a fret slot that was cut out that we can see on the edge. And then if we move down to where the second fret is, there's a line there, but this one's cut out and which is good. Because when we put that veneer in, we need it to go all the way to the edge for us. So I am going to very carefully and slowly do that on every single one. Now, if we want to talk about technique, one thing that I like to do is, is try to cut away the wood part on one side because I can't get my saw in the slot right now because of those glued sides. So if I start on one side and I get through the glue, I can then put my saw in the whole slot and take care of the other side. And the saw is in the entire front slot. And that's going to be the easiest way to do it. At least that I find.
This is a step we would take normally if, even if we were putting new frets in, we'd want to clean up these fret slots because they might have little pieces of wood in them or if they did have glue in them, we're also getting rid of that glue. A lot of people are gluing in frets nowadays, um, which I, I don't know, I have mixed feelings on. Sometimes it's needed, sometimes it's not. Wood often has a mind of its own, and things like to chip, um, even when you're being very, very delicate. We already had a little bit of a chip in here already where we had a little piece of wood here chip up. You can see that right there. So before I even go any further, I'm going to go ahead and glue that right now. I'm going to use... Uh, my Stumac. No, I'm not sponsored by them. I just really like a lot of their products. And I go by the belief of if you're going to do something, do it right. So when I'm buying tools and materials, a lot of times I'm buying from them unless I see like an absolute no need to do so. Um, but I'm using their 10 CA, which is uh, their very thin super glue. So what I'm going to do is honestly, less is more. And a little drop, it's going to soak into the wood quite a bit. And I'm going to push that right back down. Now what I'm doing is I'm putting, let's go to the top down view, bud. Let's zoom in on that, babe. Baby. That's fine. So what I'm doing is just putting a little bit of dab, a little dab of this really thin super glue on the outside edge here too, because we are going to sand a lot of this stuff up. So if there's a little extra glue there, that's okay. I would rather that be there supporting that piece that we had a chip on and not being there. But let's see if I can... Do this correctly it's tough to even see that chip anymore if i turn it at an angle you can see the super glue but you can't really see the chip so chances are if you uh own a guitar <laughs> it chipped several times in the making process and it's been fixed um especially the the big manufacturer ones Wood has its, a mind of its own, and it's often not easy to work with. Um, you guys see how delicate I'm being? You guys see how slow I'm going, and I still had that little tiny chip out. And I'm even letting the saw do all the work. I'm not putting weight on it or anything. So... Oh, it looks like we got a few more people that showed up. If, you, if you're if you new, uh, if you just joined, go, feel free to say hi in the chat. Get a little shout out. Welcome, welcome. So far, what we've done is we've pulled all the frets on this base neck. Well, we pulled the base neck even. Uh, and we're now cutting the fret slots again. Come on. I'm just letting the weight of the saw do all this for me. Chip actually looks almost like it never happened, which is fantastic.
Ooh. My goodness. Thirteen fret slots done. Fourteen. That was a very easy one. Just curious if anybody's ever played a fretless bass, go ahead and comment. I think I asked about that before, but I just want to know how many people have done that. I remember doing that in high school. Um, I remember doing it basically in jazz band. I was playing bass in one of the jazz bands because um, my high school was lucky enough to have three jazz bands for three of the four years when I went to high school because we just had that many people in our school. 400 people in each class in our school, um, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Or if you're in Canada, grade grade 9, grade 10, grade 11, grade 12. Um, and uh, we had three jazz bands, so I was playing bass in one of them. And I remember I found a fretless bass, and I was like, oh, man, this is so jazzy. I'm going to do this. And my band director's like, that's not a good idea. Intonation is going to be an issue. And of course, uh, I didn't listen. And it was a really bad, bad idea for about two months until really I started understanding how to use it, how to really listen while I play. Um, so while it wasn't the greatest for a while, I really think that it helped out my hearing. Um, a little, little chippy here, um, but it's too small to repair. That's okay. That one's not going to be seen much. So, press slots are now cleaned. So, um, what I'm going to do is actually, I'm going to vacuum this spot up real quick, and I'm going to blow some air through here just to get all the dust out of the fret slots for the time being. I just want to make sure they're all clean. I want to see them. So, we're going to do a Be Right Back screen real quick and mute the audio so that you guys don't have to listen to all that noise. So, we'll be right back.
So, welcome back, welcome back. You want to just go ahead and hit camera one and then home for me? Yeah, we can do the zoom home. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So, um, yeah. So far, so good. Um, we have to really expect um, some fret out, or uh, some chip out, sorry, um, when we're doing this. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, everything's cut except for this one where we had the chip out. I'm just going to wait a little longer before I put a saw through that again for that to dry a little bit more. The next thing we want to do is pull the nut. Um, the reason why we're going to do that is because we're actually going to end up sanding this whole thing. And uh, we're going to sand it for a couple reasons. The first reason is it's just going to take off a bunch of layers of like dirt and things like that. It's going to give us some nice fresh wood that we don't have to worry about. Um, we get to make sure that the radius is perfect in that case. And then secondly, we're going to be gluing in a bunch of veneer pieces into all these fret slots, which then we're going to sand again. So it doesn't matter what we're doing, we're sanding this fretboard. Um, when we're working with the tools and stuff on here, we're going to leave a few little scratches on top anyway. So it's just good to sand that and make it look nice and clean. Do not do that if you have a finished fretboard. So this fretboard's not finished. Um, there's no lacquer or anything on the top. It's just oil. And we're going to put oil on it when we're done anyway. So um, while I was looking at this guitar, I did notice. So this is not the original nut, which, you know, it's a pretty old guitar. Um, but it was glued in here really, really good. So I got to be very careful, but we're going to have to use a knife here to try to cut away at this nut before we try to pull it out. So all I'm doing is cutting along the seam of where the nut and the wood meet. If you want to do a top down. Yeah. Do that again on this side. You able to zoom in on that, bud? Oh, that's all right. We're just a little off. So um, I'm never going to cut this way because if this knife slips, I'm going to slice up this awesome flame neck. Look at the flaming in that maple. That's so cool. Um, so I'm always going to be cutting it away. So right where the nut the fretboard meat we're going to just put the knife in there we're going to score it just make sure we get through the glue make sure you have a new and or sharpened blade otherwise you're going to find yourself not having a good time on that You know, this might actually be the original nut. Um, when I'm cutting this, it actually is uh, popping off the finish. So I think this is the original nut in here. I'm going to score it along the top here, right along where the nut was, because it looks like this is the original, which means they put the finish on after they installed the nut. So the finish is actually holding the nut in there a bit. So... We need to do work to this nut anyway. It's pretty darn common. Looks like a bone nut. So that's good. Um, but we're going to need to do nut work anyway, because when we're playing a fretless, our action's like way lower. So if we left this nut as high as it is, um, we would find that our strings are just so high up here on the top of the fretboard uh, with no frets being there, that would be almost unplayable. So the action's going to get significantly lower when we do pull this nut. So go back to the normal hand, please. If this is loose at all. Okay. 
it's not budging. This thing is very glued in there. Oops. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a fret hammer, and this is a radius block. And all I'm gonna do is just slightly tap this, just to try to loosen that glue on that nut. I'm not trying to crank it out with the hammer in the wood block. Just trying to wiggle it. There it is. Cool. Right. So there are a couple of pieces of material I forgot to grab. We're gonna go to the Be Right Back real quick. I'm gonna grab those pieces of material. We'll be right back. So um, the tool I wanted was right in front of my face. Um, it's just uh, radius gauges. So what I want to do is just verify. I, I did this before the stream. Um, but I want to verify my fretboard radius with a radius gauge because I'm going to sand this. So I want a sanding block that is the same radius as my fretboard. This is a 16-inch radius. And I've, again, I've verified that a few times throughout the fretboard just to make sure my 16 gauge fits on it. The 20 was definitely too, too flat and uh, the 14 was definitely too curved. So um, I keep looking down here. Chances are, if you have this really thin piece of wood here, um, you're going to break this off. It's going to happen um, on an older base if it's dried out. We're going to do our best not to do so. It can be glued right back on. If it does come off, it's not even going to be noticeable. What happens is if we're sanding this and we're not super careful down here, we might hit this. So if that does happen, I'm going to do my best not to. If it happens for you, remember, just grab that piece of wood. You can glue that back on. It's going to be okay. Um, yeah. Oh, there was one more thing that I needed. It was a neck towel. I don't know where any of them are right now. So. Huzzah. All 
Not even tall enough. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, neck cowls are pretty great. Uh, I find that because there's so many one size fits all neck cowls that it's really hard to to like use them. Like this wouldn't work very well for a Gibson. We have a five string base with a pretty slanted headstock. I'm already stacking two on top of each other. So, um, any sort of support would really work. Um, the neck cowl is nice because there is cork there, so it shouldn't slide that much. Um, but it's going to slide because we're on blocks on top of each other. So that's another issue that we have. But, um, yeah, it is what it is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take some um, 220 grit sandpaper. I'm going to take my radius block here. And what I'm going to do is just start sanding a little bit of this fretboard away. I'm thinking I hate this neck cowl on just this. Let's just use this support here. It's kind of going to work better and not slide for me. Yep. That's how we're going to do this. So, um, 220 grit. When you are buying sandpaper, it's super important to buy sandpaper that has a P in front of the number. I don't remember what that P means. But... What I do remember is it means it's a much higher grade and there's a lot less of a chance of you getting uh, higher grits in your sandpaper. So especially with your high, like super high buying stuff. If I'm using 800 grit and it doesn't have a P, um, that doesn't mean that it's like it's it's 800 grit, but you might get some 220s or 400s or stuff in there. Hopefully, I'm explaining that very well. I'm not an expert on sandpaper, but the the stuff for the P tells you that it's the professional line stuff, and it's the stuff you want to be using. Um. Anyway, so sorry for the sanding noises. Um, what I'm going to do here is just sand a little bit, just to just so we can see the wood kind of lighten up. So what I did here is I just wanted to sand it really quickly to show you guys what you're looking at. Let's get a top down view for this. Now, a lot of the sanding is going to come afterward. But I wanted to show you why it's important to sand your fretboard because this is a factory neck, which means it should be even, right? It should be smooth. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's not. We have darkness here because the fretboard is actually warped so this part is actually lower and we have quite a bit of darkness over here which means the sandpaper is not hitting any of this this a little bit here and then a big chunk right here that the sandpaper is not touching because of the warp in the neck a big part right there so what we're going to do is we're going to vacuum this off we're going to put a straight edge on this thing we're going to make it perfectly even and we're going to sand this thing like crazy to make it perfectly straight so again, gonna mute the mic one more time. Be right back with that. All right, so this this is actually probably even easier to see. Um, just this big, huge portion where the warp really shows. Um, unfortunate, but it happens, uh, especially on such an old base that was kept in a closet. Oh, 
We definitely got a bow here. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and crank the truss rod on this. We're going to straighten this out. And we're going to make sure that it's perfectly straight before we start working on it any further. Because what's the point of sanding a neck that's all bowed and whatnot? Big boy rust truss rod out for this one. There we go. Oh. That is tough. It's actually quite straight already just from that one turn. Yeah. Killer. I'm sure, it looks straight still. <laughs> All right. I'm going to switch to the other cam. All right. So what I'm doing here um, is I'm just going to be looking down this neck here where I have a perfectly straight treble side, but a bowed base side. I think I mentioned before the customer on this base is turning this base fretless because instead of refretting it, he's just going to make it a fretless because we have to sand this neck straight anyway because of the twist. So that's where we're at right now. What we're gonna do is we're gonna just start sanding this stuff down so that we can get all this high stuff here on this side down to the same level as the stuff that wasn't sanded, that dark area. So I'm just gonna start going to town on that. We have the 220 here. I'm gonna support it with my hand. Let's mute that mic real quick. So we can see the darkness is gone here. We still have a little bit down here. That's okay. I still see a little bit of a bow on this side, so I'm just gonna keep sanding a little more. the mic real quick for me one more time.
All right, so take a look down the neck. One more. Oh, it's gone. Yes. Yes. Now, we used to just have this really obnoxious hump on the base side. And we just don't have that anymore, which is fantastic. Um, now, we are waiting a little bit longer. It's cut on one of these fret slots because of that chip. But it's been long enough and the chip stayed put. Didn't go out when we cut that, that's great. So that's gone now. So here we are. Um, now, can we sand this more? We still have a little bit of dark here, which means the black's not quite hitting right here. That's okay. The main purpose of me sanding before I'm putting these um, pieces of veneer in is because I have a, a, a crooked twisted neck. That's why I'm sanding. Um, you don't need to sand beforehand, but you definitely want to make sure your next level beforehand because you're going to want to sand after we start putting these things in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's go back to the front on view. So, all right. Um, perfect. Uh, what I have here is this is red oak veneer. Um, you want to do the zoom home for me, bud? Thanks. Um, it's a little darker than maple, which is why I like it. The reason why I like to go a little darker than maple is because if I had maple, it would look like, it would look very, very, very white compared to the maple on the neck because of two things. One, uh, this neck's a bit older and it was lacquered, which means it's darkened from the finish alone but the, the lacquer is going to just continue to yellow as it goes on because it's a nitrocellulose finish. So this is going to continue to yellow and darken even more. When we put this on, it's going to match this maple way more than what an actual piece of maple would. So you can see the colors are already pretty close, which is great. So I think it's going to fit in really nicely with, the, with this fretboard. It's also not going to pop out obnoxiously on the fretboard because it's not that really, really white wood, which is really great. Um, so veneer, if you've never worked with it, it's a very, very thin piece of wood. Um, it's actually pretty easy to work with, but it's also really easy to break. So think about that when you're doing that stuff. The nice thing about veneer is it's also really easy to just cut. So if we just cut this, I'm gonna pick the whitest part of the neck, I'm going to cut a big chunk off that's at least as white as the neck is. And I'm just using regular household scissors for this. Not Stumac scissors, believe it or not. Um, yeah, we're just going to fit these right in all of these fret slots. So um, it should be and it will be a tight fit. We want that to be a tight fit. How tight of a fit yet? I don't know. Um, Actually, it looks like it's a very tight fit, which might be a fantastic thing, but we might need to widen these fret slots a little bit. So um, let's just see what happens. Um, now, you saw me break this in half. What that did is it created an edge that's not perfectly straight. So this edge isn't perfectly straight. What I want to do is I want to take a piece of sandpaper, put it on a flat surface, and I'm just going to sand the side of this down a little bit. I'm being very gentle because it is veneer. And now I have a straight edge there. See if we compare that to the other side. Not so straight edges on top. All broken and whatnot. The straight edge that I just sanded is right there. So, big difference. Um... I'm going to cut slash break a fairly, fairly tall piece off. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to put it right in this slot here and see what happens. Because I'm pretty sure we're a little too thick yet. Yeah, it's a thick boy. So what we need to do is we need to widen that slot a little bit.
So now what I'm doing is I'm coming down. We work straight on when we were we were cutting these straight down. Now what I'm doing is I'm just going to come at a slight angle now. Less is more, right? You can always take a little bit of more wood off. You can't add more wood on, usually. It's starting to fit more. We still need to cut it off a little. It needs to be a little wider yet. Oh, just barely not making it. end up needing to do is sand this veneer a little bit. This will be fitting much better. Just a little tight on the top end here, the treble side. Okay, so now we, we actually have that fitting in there completely. Right on. All right, so um, obviously to sit there and do that for every single thread slot is a lot of just not going, a lot going on for the, for the um, stream. So let's go ahead and glue this one in. Let's cut it down. Let's sand it slightly so you guys see more of a finished product of what this is going to look like um i've been using the thin super glue up till now so now what i'm going to do is let's just open open up a new bottle of the stumac 20 which is their medium viscosity super glue Serper Blur. Remember Serper Blur? This whip tip. Stick it on there. Now. This again is medium viscosity, so it's not gonna be crazy thin like the other one. So we have to be very careful because if we put too much in, it's gonna squeeze out the sides and it's gonna cause us more sanding in the long run. Actually, let's, uh, how zoomed in can you get on this here, bud? Oh, uh, yes, this is why we spend the money on the camera. That's great. Go down a little bit for me. Don't like that. Do you guys see that big glob? That's just a big bubble. We don't want that. So I'm going to get all those bubbles out of there.
So that's the medium. And now what I'm gonna do is actually come over here on the side. Let's get a little bit of the thin stuff on the edge there. I'm usually pretty scared to work on it this fast after not letting it glue. But worst case scenario, I could do it again. Because I can just saw it back out if it doesn't work the way I want it on stream. So in a perfect world, we have this done on all of them now. And what we're going to do is come back and sand this now. Um, I'm going to jump up to the 400 grit right away. We got a piece of that cool grain in there, which is really awesome. So we would sand this down a lot more where you wouldn't see this edge with the super glue and stuff, but I don't want to spend time sanding one spot of a neck because you can imagine how bad that is. We also, we would need to be sanding the sides here. We're going to also have to fill in little gaps we're going to get that's going to be really natural it's the same way they filled them in when there was a gap there from the frets but on top here now we get a little preview of how awesome this is going to look Now, again, I mentioned we got to sand this yet. We got to sand this yet. And fill in gaps. We would have cleaned this a little more before we oiled it and such, too. But we'll come back to it and we'll. We'll sand it more. We're going to end up sanding this whole thing down a lot more when we're done with the whole thing. So, but you can see how we have no fret slot anymore because we don't have that gap there anymore. And we got this really cool piece of veneer in there now. I'm going to back out a little. See what it looks like kind of further away there. And it's perfectly smooth here, too. You don't feel that. There's no gap here. There's nothing to worry about on this part. So when you're playing, that's not going to be an issue, too. So pretty cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and continue to do this. Although, because I have to widen every single fret slot, you can go to the zoom home. Um, 
I did not anticipate having to widen every single fret slot on this. And I don't want to sit here in a live video and have you guys just watch me widen every single fret slot. So what I'll do is I'll get all these widened. I'll start putting this stuff in. And what we'll do is we'll go live again. Um, maybe tomorrow I'll try to go live. And we'll get to the point where we need to sand the whole fretboard again. Start putting it together, stuff like that. Might not be tomorrow. I'm going to wait until those strings get here so that the next thing I do when I go live is have all of these installed, but nothing's going to be sanded yet. So we're going to have to sand the sides, sand the top. We're going to have to oil everything up again. And then what we're going to do after that is install the nuts, install the new strings when they get here, and then do a full setup on this thing. Um, again, I am super excited to see how this turns out. I think this is going to look really cool. Uh, hopefully you guys like it too. Go ahead and say in the comments what you thought of the red oak. I think the red oak was a really cool choice just because it's not going to be that super bright white maple we would have gotten. Um, and it keeps that darkness that matches rather nicely, in my opinion. So thank you guys so much for, for hanging out with me. Uh, as I said before at the beginning of the chat, below in the description is a Patreon and stuff like that. With the Patreon, you get access to uh, my Discord channel. Um, with the highest level Patreon, you actually get access to personal DMs. You can send me DMs, ask me questions about things you have going on with your guitar, stuff like that too. Um, we do shout outs and stuff like that. The Patreon really honestly is just a great way to supplement the fact that I'm doing these streams. It gives us a little bit more revenue so we can start upgrading even more cameras, um, getting more higher quality audio. Uh, being able to pay our producer <laughs> who's sitting here doing this for free, uh, be able to pay me who's sitting here doing this for free. Although I'm getting paid to work on the base, but I'm not getting paid to stream. Um, and that's just going to start allowing us to stream more and more often. So the more Patreons we have, the more we can stream. I would literally sit here every single day and stream four hours a day, guitar repair work. If I could, if you got stuff and you're out of state and you want to ship it to me for work, go ahead and send me a message. Um, our Facebook link is below. Our merch link is below. There's even just a donation. You don't want to be hooked on a Patreon every single month. Go ahead and throw a donation out there. Uh, we take those as well. Everything that you donate or that you give through the Patreon is going towards our streaming and our streaming alone. So thanks again. Uh, really appreciate the time you guys took to come out. Uh, if you're watching this afterward, go ahead and drop a like and hit that subscribe button and we'll see you real soon. Thanks so much, everyone.